when you are done steeping your tea, you should remove your tea bag so it doesn't get bitter. But no one's drinking this. Hello, curios, and welcome to a Q&A in a whole bathtub full of tea. I wanted to do a Q&A video, and then I saw uh, Christine from Simply Neological literally do one of those I answer your assumptions videos in a bathtub full of tea. And I thought, that looks like fun. The tea bag sticking to me. <laughs> this is how I die. <laughs> no, uh, spill in the tea session would go proper if I didn't have some actual tea. And some Welsh cakes. Hmm. That's mighty good. I asked you to provide questions and assum any assumptions you had, and we would try to address those. And sort of just a nice, weird getting to know you. We're having tea together in the most odd way I could surmise. All right, let's see some of these assumptions. My assumption is, in fact, there are three Kiris, one that can sing, one that can write, and one that thinks really, really hard. While one is about, the other two hide in a teacup. You're not a bard, rogue, multi-class. You're really a cleric. Seriously, with all the happy energy that you've produced in your advocacy for mental health, you must have taken a few levels in cleric. I like that. You know what? I, I will fully accept that. I've kind of hung up my my rogue class and have really thrown uh, stuff into support because I find that's a lot more useful than, you know, backstabbing people. Where's this analogy going? I don't know! Did you ever see the Curios Discord channel becoming the wonderful support community it has become? Honestly, for the Discord, yes. Because the reason I started a Discord is I wanted a hub for all of you to be able to hang out. Because I noticed what was going on on my Twitter, what was going on in my video comments. Every time I streamed, the Twitch channel was just so full of love and support. And it was just, it was great. You'd sort of outgrown me in the best way. Because I didn't need to be there. Like the stream created a place for all of you to go and talk. But I didn't really need to be streaming because you all would talk to each other on your own and that that's just so beautiful and i love it and i'm so glad that discord worked out because i was like well i will do the forums and i hadn't really known about discord at the time or maybe it wasn't that big i don't know i i didn't trust it forums really wasn't working and it felt very disconnected and now we've got the discord and you have all just blossomed and it just ah my heart you don't even know Assumption. You're actually from the Summerlands. You were a gift to your family for favors done for the Fae, but you're not a changeling. You'll never die. You'll just go home one day and we'll make a deal to take Angelique with you. Do you have a specific sexuality you identify as or do you not care for labels? Also beyond that, is there anything else you would like to share that you identify with? I sort of feel like when a lot of people say, I don't like labels, they're usually coming from a place of privilege. Like, I have had a lot of uh, heterosexual people <laughs> usually say like, well, why do you need all those labels? Because that's how I communicate who I am. Maybe not everything fully fits, but it's not really about a label so much as it is. I need language to explain who I am to you because we, we need words. Like for the longest time I remember uh, not even knowing what bisexual was until about, oh gosh, no one was really using it until maybe my high school. <laughs> like it just wasn't a really thing anyone really talked about around us. So it was like this, this foreign concept. And for a while I was like, yes, that. As I began to learn more about sexuality as a spectrum, I, personally prefer the term pan over bi, because while I do believe bisexual can mean the same thing as pan, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, even in the LGBTQ community, who are very exclusionary and have not necessarily jumped on the gender fluidity train of, of fully supporting trans or non-binary. We, unfortunately, have the same problems as everybody else. Everyone is as inclusive as we want them to be. It's a safer place usually, but you will still run into, say, TERFs, trans exclusionary feminists, who do even exist in the lesbian community. Every community has their issues, and LGBTQ is not exempt from that, to, to be completely honest. So because there is so much 
issue around binary contextually. I prefer pan to bi, but I will identify as bi to someone who may not understand what I mean when I say pan with the language that we currently have is I am a pan romantic demisexual, which essentially means I can have romantic feelings for anyone regardless of their gender, but my sexual attraction is dependent upon a close connection. So that I, I am, I'm not a person who can do like, wah, let's go and have a good time. Um, I, it's just, it's not, it's not for me. It just doesn't work. Nothing, nothing gets going. Uh, let's see, I also identify with, I say paganism because it's sort of an umbrella term. Uh, you've possibly seen my altar in past videos. I, I use witchcraft as a practice. I focus my attentions more on um, the energies of the earth around us, spirits, and, and that sort of thing more than I do a specific pantheon. The whole play with magic, magic in this sense, um, and also actually in the fictional sense in my opinion, but it's all about intent. It's a matter of intent and sending purposeful energy in a direction. And that's kind of really what I feel like most religion is. If people are really interested, I will get into that big thing, but I'm sure most people didn't really tune into this Q&A for me to talk about my religious, my spiritual beliefs. I don't think I can even really call it religious beliefs. Ooh. Crumb in my bath. This bath is officially crummy. By that I mean it has literal crumbs in it. It's actually still quite lovely. You can see how red my face is getting because I'm really sweating. This is great, actually. No assumptions here. So where do you get your creative ideas from? Writing and poetry ideas. Your LARP character. Where do you go to get inspired? Okay, so I'm sure everyone's heard me talk about curiosity until I turn blue. Or you turn blue. We all turn blue. With your curiosity is to yes and a bunch of stuff. You have to absorb other things to... It, it's very odd. It's like you almost have to consume stories in order to create them. Like if you started looking at stories and art, like calories, you know, you have a certain amount of calories per day that you need to just function as a living being. Sort of feel like stories and art work that way. You have to consume a certain amount of art if you're going to create art. It's, it, it's a weird comparison, but that's the best way I can put it. Carry around a little notebook to write down weird little ideas, even if you're like, that's freaking going nowhere. Who knows, maybe you will find a place for it like two years down the road and you go, oh, that's what that's for. Because your brain is always trying to make connections to patterns. That's just how our, our brains work. Assumption, you've transcended good and evil and your true alignment is chaotic chaotic. Why would you say I've that? I've always assumed you're a wonderful, caring soul. Oh. However, it would be, would it be safe to assume that that fuse has gotten shorter or your collective XP has sharpened you into that hardened warrior you are today? I wouldn't say the fuse has gotten shorter, per se, as a fae of many, many countless years. <sighs> I feel like it's about noticing red flags, and while compassion towards others is extremely important, and I am fully about empathy and practicing vigilant empathy and all that jazz. I think it's also really important to practice empathy and compassion for yourself. i am be upfront with you, I was in an abusive relationship, a very abusive relationship from 2014 to 2016. That was two years of my life where I'm still recovering from that because the emotional abuse that went into that, you're not conscious of what's going on or the way your brain is being trained to sort of be unkind to yourself. So now when I see like those those weird little narcissist red flags, it's like, ah, no. And sometimes I feel like the best thing to do is, is to call attention to it when you can. And sometimes I've also noticed it's best to just, when you see those red flags go, hmm, I'm not gonna engage with that. Because in some cases, some people just wanna watch the world burn, are just there because they thrive on drama and attention. And I think a big part of that experience gaining is accepting that you can't help people who don't wanna be helped. Also acknowledging that you're not somebody's therapist and you're not getting paid for it. People get paid a decent amount of money, like either from out of pocket or from someone's insurance to help them with these problems. You're not getting paid for that, you're not. You don't have, nor do you have the mountain of debt from school 
that you're probably still paying off that gave you the skills to be able to do that. Are you reading or listening to The Dresden Files and what are your thoughts? I've actually only read slash listened to the first one. I want to get back to it, but it has a very different tone to what I need right now, if that makes sense. I, I'm i currently working on Changeling, obviously. I'm trying to get it done. Angelique keeps like guilting me about like, hey, Alice needs you, and I'm like, crap, she does. Um, so I stopped listening to Dresden Files because it was getting me in a very different mindset. So I've only read the first one. I did enjoy it, but I don't feel like I can form an opinion on it yet. So I will let you know when I start those back up again. When things constantly and sometimes swiftly drastically change, how do you stay afloat through all of it? What are things you do for yourself to keep you on track? Um, one of them is I make dumb little videos that I enjoy that I also hope uh, you enjoy because one, I'm making content, so I'm still staying on track of that, but it's something that also kind of treats me. Like this, this is great. Like I, I sweated out so many toxiny things. It was, a, it was so warm in here. I had to open up the window just to make sure that the lens stopped uh, fogging up. It was great. It was, it was beautiful. I really enjoyed that. Um, lists honestly helped me so much because when you start to feel overwhelmed and your brain is the only thing keeping track of what you have to do, one, you're bound to forget something, and two, it seems like so much more than it is. And when you put it on a list, you can actually see on this one sheet of paper, or if you, maybe you have it on your phone or whatever, but I, I prefer to write it down because there's something very satisfying. It actually releases endorphins to do a check mark. Um, so, I will write a list down on a piece of paper and being able to see all of it on paper and just how it can fit on a piece of paper is so, I don't know what it is. It's just something very relieving being able to go, okay, it's not actually as much as I thought it was. That list keeps me on track. Uh, if I need to break it down into tinier things, like if it's like film a video for about the latest Laura Olympus thing, I will then put a little thing below it of like write script, film, edit. Like, and those are things I can all check off, which makes it much more manageable because then it's breaking it down into smaller bites. When you are feeling overwhelmed and you've made your list of things you have to do, put something on it that is very easily achievable because I struggle with the impossible task feeling of like, there's too much to do, I can't get it all done. But you would be amazed with what it does for your mental health and outlook to get one thing done. Like just to be able to make that one check mark and you're like, oh, all right. Yeah, let's do another one. That felt great. It's weird. I don't fully understand the science behind it. Now I want to look it up, but I've got other things to do. Make a mental note to research checkmark endorphins. Okay, I created a note. Research checkmark endorphins. Thank you, Siri. No sweat. As a fellow bi girl, I was wondering when you came out, but that's a really personal question, so I fully respect if you want to keep your privacy. All right. Andy, I do want to actually answer this question. But I almost feel like it needs a uh, video on its own because we're gonna get into some serious pie. But the the long story the long the long story short of it is I came out to friends about senior year of high school freshman year of college. Um, I think I actually came out freshman year. I had a few friends who were like, uh, "Doy." One friend at the time had a this is a, such a huge understatement horrible reaction to me coming out, uh, because if I speak my truth in regards to the, the spectrum of where I probably fall, if you've got like straight over here and like full on lesbian is over here, because um, when people say bi, I think they, they mistake the fact that like you're directly in the middle, as I'm sure you've run into. And some people are, don't get me wrong. Some people are very equally attracted to both. But I find myself like, especially, it's weird, as, when I first was sort of discovering my sexuality, I realized I was probably more like, here? It's like, oh, I really, really like women. Women are freaking great. Um, I was still demisexual, but like pan-romantic, very much like, I with a heavy leaning towards women. And then I had this very, very bad experience with my friend at the time, and I'll go into her reaction probably in a later video. It's one of those things that I've avoided talking about because she's the poster child of what not to do. And then I never really spoke about it with my parents ever, um, but it was, I was pretty open online about it. I just never sat down with that conversation and had it with my parents until last July. My parents were in town for the 4th of July 
And my dad is going through, uh, he's got frontal temporal dementia. So I wasn't entirely sure this is a conversation that I could have with him, to be honest. And my mom has since kind of been like, meh, I think it'd probably confuse him. I uh, took my mom out and we went, we went shopping for shoes and stuff. And it was hot as heck. And we stopped at a Starbucks and I was like, can I, I want to talk to you about something. And I came out to her because, because uh, as you know, I'd met someone and she makes me so happy. I kind of know I'm like, no, this is this is the one. Like I wanted to talk to my mom about it because I was like, I need to come out because um, I just I just knew. So I, I I had a really hard time saying it, and my mom, bless her, because she's not stupid, was was very gentle. She's like, just say it, you know, like probably won't be as bad as you think it is. And I didn't want to explain Pam, <laughs> so I was like, I'm I'm bisexual. So I, I told her, and she's like. Okay, well, I, I don't know entirely what does that mean, like, you like women? Does that mean you like more than one person? And I was like, oh, um, it means I, I'm attracted to both, and I actually, I, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I, I met someone, and I think, I think I want to, they might be the one. She, she's really amazing. I told her about Angelique, and I asked him, do you want to meet her? And she came out and, and met uh, my family at dinner and it was really nice. And then this past Christmas, I got to bring her with me. So that was really great. Um, yeah. And I know, um, Grace, I saw that you asked how we met and I want to do a separate video for that as well. So don't think I've forgotten. It just seems like it, it shouldn't be given in the tea land. But I wanted to thank everybody for watching. Um, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. My battery is dying, so I'm racing against time. I love you so much, Curios, and I will talk to you later. Please stay curious. Oh, and if you have any questions um, for the next time, leave them in the comments below. <laughs>